So, Ludo, great to have you. Um, Ludo Ulrich, actually, where is your last name from? I never asked you. Yeah, German, Swiss, German, Swiss, east of France, I would argue. So I get people confused. They don't really realize I could be from France based on my last name indeed, yeah. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, really the core of some of these talks, that is the integration between corporates and startups. And you come really from a very long experience of uh, really build your, your career over uh, big brands, the, you know, the Salesforce, the Apple, uh, the Microsoft of the world, yeah. and, and then uh, over time evolved over you know, the world of innovation and the integration with startups. So it's really at the core of uh, these kind of discussions that we're going to have. So yeah. I'm really excited to do that. Um, well, let's start from uh, the very beginning. Yeah. So also, you know, your international background, you end up also studying in Italy, all places. So tell, point, us, yes. tell, us, tell us what, what uh, brought you to America. Let's start from that thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I could have ended in Italy, but for whatever reason, I, I ended up in the in the US. And the reason is, I, I used to work. Uh, I started my career, um, you know, at uh, yeah, I did a small job, uh, a small uh, stint at Apple, but mostly I started at Microsoft, and um, uh, I was, you know, selling enterprise software, uh, promoting enterprise mobility. So we talk about mobility in many ways, but that was the mobile business at the time. It was no iPhone, you know, Microsoft against BlackBerry, good times. And ended up so still Bal Balmer at the time, right? So who was your CEO at the time? Uh, yes, correct. Yeah, my whole time. Yeah, so different type of Microsoft than today, to be to be fair. Uh, and uh, but great experience, and I ended up uh, having an opportunity to move to the US uh, through Microsoft. So I landed. So you started Microsoft in France. Yes, correct. Did five years again, different jobs, and finished in the mobile business. And the mobile business was developing a lot, and so I ended up having an opportunity to move to the US. I mean, as always, it's not something that happens uh, to you. You need to kind of look for it. And, uh, and I moved to Seattle, uh, you know, just after getting married, you know, arrived in Seattle and, and arrived on that big campus and, um, and realized, you know, how big this market is. Back to, you know, trying to connect that to what I'm doing today. It's one of the good thing about, about of course, the U.S. market. And, uh, and after doing different jobs in the product organization for mobile, I got a chance to uh, lead the startup program of Microsoft. And uh, so it's a program that some of you might have heard of called Bispark. Yeah, we're uh, going to talk about that because I think it's a very good uh, seed of a bunch of programs that then yeah. over time developed. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what Did you study uh, a technical background or more business? More business, frankly. I've always been like in a business, uh, business school context. Text, but always kind of geeky and loving technology and uh, you know back in Europe I think technology was less embedded than it is today from what I've heard so kind of build that you know assets or that strengths on the side mostly rather than from a curriculum standpoint but yeah business background for sure. Did you knew that you would go into technology at the time when you were kind of looking around and say what's next? You know, it's hard to be super intentional. At least I know some, you know, very young folks I meet now, or founders, exactly know where they want to go. I don't think I was that clear. But at some point, you know, what's your what your passion is, and it's one thing at least I knew early is like I would like to rely on my, you know, what I do from the part, most of the day and what I like. So I, I was trying, you know, trying to aim at this. Yeah. And did you know you would end up in a different country, and you know, kind of the international that was global intentional. view would be, you know, part of your being? Yes. Yes, okay, that clearly, was easier, right? clearly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you grow up in the in the in the kind of a stage of a uh, of doing one year in different countries at university, the the uh, Erasmus? Yeah, that's that's what brought me to Italy, okay, actually. So, so I have to admit, you know, a lot of people say Erasmus is the best initiative from the European Commission, either or from the European Union. I would say, generally speaking, uh, definitely a good experience. And so Erasmus started a year that graduated. I was so freaking frustrated. <laughs> Missed it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, every second of Erasmus. So uh, you know, being in the right place at the wrong time has happened. So, uh, no, I'm a product of Erasmus, and you know, I've got that you know affiliation and love for Italy uh, through that. So of course, you know. Yeah. Very nice. All right, so Bispark. I think this is a very interesting, um, you know, I think project. What happened to Bispark? Is that still going? It's still or? around. I mean, the branding, you know, it was a pretty much a 10 years old brand. So I think last year Microsoft renamed it with a much more literal name, Microsoft for Startups. So mm -hmm. kind of straightforward, but it's the same spirit. Yes, absolutely. It's the same so spirit. tell us a little bit more. What was the initial idea? How that developed? What were the KPIs if there were yep. any at the time? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, back then, and again, it, in the context of a company like Microsoft that needs, uh, and we can talk about it later, everybody now needs to build an ecosystem of developers. But 
back then, you know, uh, tech companies like Microsoft, of course, have to be intentional about developers and the way they nurture them. Uh, and when I say developer, you know, it translates into basically a co-founder of CTO in the startup world. So it's the same function. It's somebody who's going to build some technical product. Uh, sales, uh, Microsoft at the time realized that, you know, uh, there was much more competition. So I think we could argue that Microsoft has always been the most like developer focused company. You mentioned Steve Ballmer, there's this famous video where he said developer, developer, developers that a lot of people still watch today. <laughs> Very energetic guy, no matter what we think about the, this uh, gentleman. And, um, and, uh, and so, uh, as part of it, we were, uh, trying to think about a way to be very appealing to developers. And I think it's something pretty straightforward, which is saying, you know what, uh, we want to give away basically our development tools, a lot of the technology to founders so that we remove any sort of friction to create a company. I'm so, sorry, that was the only program because today, most of those large companies have developer relations that is, yeah. you know, like a department itself. And then there's a stuff for startups and their investment, all different, yeah. you know, shapes and forms. At that time, was the only kind of core piece of the company that was dealing with explicitly with developers? Um, I, I would say there was, of course, uh, a team that was sitting next to me dealing with developers, corporate developers, and the broader set of developers, including students, etc. So we got, you know, of course, Microsoft being a very sophisticated company with that audience would have different initiative. But Bispark was the brand for startup developers, right. aka CTOs and co-founders. Uh, and I think back to your question, though, indeed, the, the playbook was specific in, in a way where the goal was not to invest. That was a very clear uh, mandate. It's like, how do we build an ecosystem by, you know, evangelizing the technology and making sure there was an ecosystem that built with the Microsoft technology. That's a short, you know, mandate, if you will. Cool. Um, and again, so how does uh, that program develop over time? And, uh, you know, I went international. I met some of the guys at the time in Europe. They were developing the same yeah. program in different countries that were different regions. So very, very sophisticated. As, as very Microsoft. sophisticated. You'll yeah. probably hear a little bit of nostalgia from that time because, indeed, there was a time where we had like a massive network of, you know, Microsoft employees who would wake up in the morning and basically have the ability to engage with startup ecosystem to represent. And again, we can talk about it, strong KPIs and, and metrics, but the goal was to represent uh, Microsoft with that, you know, with that ecosystem. And right now it sounds obvious, you know, you read the magazines and, you know, we know that, you know, startup is the key component of the economy and everywhere, but back then it was still forming. So I think there was a, I would give tribute, tribute to, the, to the company, to Microsoft for making a bet and being intentional about, you know, paying full-time headcounts whose job was to engage with that community and make sure, of course, they promote the, the tech, the, the technology and the ecosystem and what Microsoft stands for, right? And the profile of those individuals was very diverse. Sometimes they had, they were the kind of people who had more of a business background. They would know all the venture capitalists. They would know, um, you know, the Microsoft customers, and they would be able to map to do the matchmaking between, you know, startups and and basically the the Microsoft as a platform as a go to market. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they were more strong strong on the technical side. So they were they would be very legitimate, like you know. Um, 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 technical leaders in you know in Italy, I remember in particular there was one in, in Canada, and they would be respected by developers and would basically you know uh, uh, get 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 folks to you know build their company on the Microsoft technologies. It was mostly Asia at the time. There was a big push, or yeah. it was truly global. Uh, and I would say you know it was a hundred plus team that were you know basically doing that job. So it was really a global team. Uh, and I think what was uh, fantastic is like every time there would be a new product line, including I remember back then Microsoft launched Kinect, that sensor mm -hmm. that was like used in the gaming industry, like for Xbox. Uh, what are the applications that you can use in like medical devices, medical situation, etc. So every time it would be added to the program and I would be my job, the job of the team worldwide to basically expose that new opportunity. Hey, there's a new piece of technology, might be hardware, might be software, go play with it, build something and etc and having back to your question then we built upon this like a few different programs where we were exposing some of the best companies to you know leadership at, at microsoft to venture capitalists here in silicon valley so there was there was a lot of things that built upon this and build that umbrella brand this park do you think that in retrospect today uh, microsoft management sees that as a as a success overall the program itself and the investment in it and the, the way that they measure it Hundred percent, because you know I keep meeting you know uh, you know literally every week folks who benefited from this program who you know got trained on the technology because of the program end up having jobs in like large corporations or build companies that are successful. There's a lot of alumni from this park who ended up building like very successful companies. Uh, you know, one of the first company I joined the program is called Zogdoc in New York. You know, which raised you know hundreds of millions. You know, that's that platform that connects patients and and, and doctors. So you when you see those results, uh, 
obviously it has an impact. And I would say back to your question, the program still exists. It's a fairly different flavor. Now it's all about Azure, the cloud computing platforms. I would say there's like, you know, more focused kind of areas for the program, but yes, absolutely. And and since then, Microsoft really over in, invested on that audience and created a fully uh, fully fledged, you know, corporate VC uh, called M12 Microsoft Ventures. So I feel like I'm talking a lot about Microsoft now, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's true that they, they they have like an arsenal of of programs to basically be extremely intentional about you know having a having a strong ecosystem around them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. So what took you from there to um, Startup Weekend and then what whatever developed over Startup Weekend? So first of all, like a personal reason, when you work for massive companies like Microsoft and I've always been kind of always one of the youngest in all the teams I work with. You know, I was like, oh, maybe it's time to be like the, the adult in the room, right? And and, and so I ended up um, I ended up supervising. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, well, managing a relationship with an organization called Startup Weekend, grassroots global movements that you know operating all over the world, and uh, we were a large sponsor for them. It was yeah, like it a, started in Seattle, around Seattle. Right? Started in Seattle, technically started in Colorado, Colorado without getting into yes. details with the founders. But anyway, the company was at quarter. It was like a fifteen people shop. Uh, totally grassroots, managing a large network of volunteers around the world. And I was truly impressed by what they were doing. And so, uh, you know, my team decided to use them as a, you know, as a, you know, uh, a network that could, you know, expose our brand to the startup communities around the world. They had, they had the same footprint as Microsoft. You know, there was not that many companies that had the same footprint and the same ambition. Mm -hmm. And so we partnered with them over the years. I got to know them and, uh, yeah, as a large sponsor and got an opportunity to join them. I remember them at the time, uh, one of the major sponsors was the Kaufman Foundation. We were the Kaufman at the same time. And then, you know, things develop over time. It was the same year that Microsoft was one of the key, key Indeed. partners. Indeed. And the company was not to be too specific, but it was a nonprofit organization, yeah. uh, 501c3. So eligible to get funding from organization at the Kaufman Foundation, who at the time has indeed the, the, the benefit of being probably the largest um, um, a foundation focused on entrepreneurship and still today creates a lot of materials, a lot of data points about entrepreneurship globally. And so they decided to invest uh, uh, a large uh, grant, I think it was 2.5 million or something like this in Startup Weekend to scale the model globally. Mm -hmm. And so that technically, I'm glad you mentioned that, but that's what triggered the conversation between Startup Weekend and myself at Salesforce where they said, hey, we just got this grant. We need to scale the team, build up the, the, the capabilities. We thought of you, Ludo. We like you as a sponsor. Why don't you jump ship? So pretty spontaneous conversation. I, I have to admit, I never considered that before. Mm -hmm. uh, How big but was the team at the time? When you probably, I think I was employee number 18, so okay. fairly small. Uh, I don't want to say junior, senior. It's not the point. I don't believe in age. Very mature team, but clearly folks who were at the beginning of their career. So, yeah. I mean, the goal was like a simply and very humbly, I got to tell you, because I had to, a lot to learn from them, but bringing a little bit of the sense of the structure and all the things I learned in, a, in an organization that's over-optimized, I would argue, with years and years of BCG and McKinsey optimizing yes. Microsoft and brought a lot of that experience into that small organization so that we can scale with the with that you know mandate that the Kaufman Foundation, you know, through the funding as well as other sponsors gave us. I have to say that 10 years later, the Startup Weekend is one experience that I keep suggesting in particular for founders they're looking to complement their team. Yeah, it is the one the one area still in a no profit uh, umbrella. Now it's a little bit different, clearly, but where you can actually find uh, people that you don't normally don't find around. There is not such a thing as a as a platform to look for co founders. And I think that's the closest thing that I've seen in the years. I agree, and especially at the time and at scale, that's definitely one of the reasons why I love the model. I ended up joining them as an employee, and I, I would argue specifically when it comes to Europe. My experience is, you ask me, I studied business. There was no engineering school, UX school, anything around me. Like, you know, it's traditionally more the case in the US where, you know, serendipity can happen. You can yeah, meet those co founders. So, Startup Week can actually work very well in Europe, in particular for the very reason. You know, just the way I would pitch it to folks, like it sounds like you still do today, I do it today as well. It's like, go meet 100 people who don't necessarily have anything to do with you. And you might end up some, meeting somebody that's going to be your co founder. You might even not know what a co-founder is, but basically someone who can help you build a business you've been dreaming of. And a lot of people, especially when I was obviously trying to lead a lot of the business conversation, were asking, hey, what's Startup Weekend about? How many jobs do you create when you talk to a government? How much money they raise? How many startups did you generate? I'm like, yeah, all that's true. We can track. It's very hard. But I think what we like to look is how many people meet on Monday morning. Hmm. after the startup weekend because you know they love the idea to work on over the weekend yeah for those of you who don't know it's like that you know fast track 54 hours you know very intense experience over a weekend where you build you know maybe not a company but at least you know some sort of prototype of your idea 
Uh, and sometimes you just realize that's not necessarily your passion. You know, from Friday to Sunday, you have a lot of reason to like or dislike the project. But when you meet on Monday, uh, somewhere in a coffee shop, that's where maybe some the magic can happen. And I actually just met last week a founder who, you know, he, he, uh, from um, from uh, Chile, who told me they met uh, he met his co-founder on a startup weekend. Uh, you know, so it just it just there was a lot of uh, impact for that matter. Do you know how big is is a startup weekend today? How many meetups they do or meetings? Because it does actually scale. I mean, that model of uh, being local and global still scale. I, I don't have the, the 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 specific numbers, but we're still talking about operating in you know a few hundred cities around the world, and the frequency changes based on the nature of the ecosystem. I think. One of the things I, I, I notice is that the startup we can tend to have some sort of specialty. Mm. So without being too, you know, make too much of a caricature, you know, you would go in Italy, you would do something focused maybe on the fashion industry, on the tourism industry, or you know, or on uh, or anything that was that would be kind of a, a strength of that particular city, that particular country, and just to bring the talent around it. Uh, and the other thing I would say is like it's it's now part of the Techstars platform. So Techstars technically. You know, merge, acquired slash acquired. You know, startup weekend. So now it's part of a you know a broader organization with you know with a venture arm with like accelerator programs and everything. So uh, part of that movement, they, it it, it puts some structure around it, and I'm I'm sure it's going to be operating for for years to come. So that happens a few years. That merge that you're talking about, maybe two years after you join, or you know, was shortly thereafter, right? Yeah, so after I left, probably two and a half years after. I guess after you left. After I left, so yeah, of course we saw that coming. I think you know, uh, one of the board member of the organization was Brad Fell, who wrote a lot of around startup communities. Wrote a book about it. Techstars founder. Techstars founder. Uh, so uh, through him and through a bunch of other reasons, the company has always been very close to Techstars that shared a lot of values. And so it was a natural fit that evolved into, you know, making uh, making the move. So when it happened after I left, I was not surprised. And I think it was a fantastic outcome. And now they're fully integrated. So they're fully integrated. A, a branch of, uh, yeah, of it's, one of the programs that Techstars has under control. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, it's basically what they call the startup program. So that's kind of their way to tell, you know, to to walk the walk when they tell the story that Techstars, you know, cares about communities around the world. They happen mm -hmm. to operate this business, you know, uh, you know, which is self-sustained, you know, based on, on you know, it's, uh, around the world. So that that's actually fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And then Salesforce happened, right? After that? Yeah. 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 So, and then you kind of recreated something similar with a different, probably, um, you know, shape, but uh, very similar to this park, at least in, in the, at, the, at the core. So tell us a little bit more about that experience. Yeah. I mean, what can you do? You know, you go back to what you know and like, and you think it, it could work. So, uh, I mean, it's always like, uh, as always, not to be, you know, to make it too systematic. You asked me if I was intentional about my career. I have to admit it was not over, it, it was an engineer. One thing I knew is at some point I would love to live in San Francisco in Silicon Valley. I mean. After, you know, I used to go there at, at least once a month, you know, technically a lot of my team when I was at Microsoft was based down in Mountain View, but I was thinking about moving at some point and I got a phone call from an ex-colleague of mine who told me about Salesforce. Like anybody else on earth, I thought Salesforce was just a CRM company doing like a sales automation uh, software in the cloud. Uh, and uh, he told me I was wrong and there's much more than this and including uh, a lot of technologies and things that could be interesting for the startup community. And he said, you know, you, you know that space very well. Why don't you come and join us? And so... Not to uh, mention that the biggest real estate developer in San Francisco. That too that. now, yeah. <laughs> big, big tower here, but uh, not back then. And so it, it got me curious. Uh, and so I, I, I would skip the details, but, you know, there's an annual conference called Dreamforce that just happened. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, gathering a lot of people that I got a chance to attend. And I have to admit, I was impressed about the playbook and discovered you know that indeed a uh, um, uh, good learning actually as a as a company when you start having a lot of you know products you need to make sure you know your audience knows all those products and those and those things and I realize Salesforce as a fully fledged you know developer platform you know for the technologist in the room or in the audience you know they acquired a company called Heroku at the time you know cloud uh, platform platform as a service so. There was an opportunity to tell that story and actually the fact that I didn't know myself being a member of that community, all that made me think, yeah, maybe there's actually an opportunity to, to get that out, uh, specifically to the startup community because that was the that was the plan. And so, again, skipping the detail, uh, didn't move instantly and accept the job whatsoever, but, you know, maybe four or five months later, I ended up uh, uh, deciding to move to San Francisco to, to take that, that, that to, to take over that job. Uh, was frankly, like, you know, Pretty much a carte blanche to rebuild some sort of startup program or so, some sort of startup ecosystem outreach program. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, I had to define the KPIs based on my experience at Microsoft. So I would argue, yes, I replicated a lot of what Microsoft did, but not the same necessarily means and, and budget at the beginning, to be fair. And, uh, and also a different DNA, right? The company was fairly different. It's not necessarily a strong developer, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, culture, so to say, uh, different line of products. And also, most importantly, which was very exciting for me, uh, a very cool story in the cloud, right? I know we take it for granted. You know, we don't talk about cloud. No, it's AI and you know, all kinds of things. But at the time, you know, cloud was the new thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I think it was a relevant story that I decided to, you know, tell. Yeah, that, that's what was one of the big myths of uh, Microsoft, by the way, that they were trying to catch up over, you know, being, being at the core. Of the, of the, of on the uh, business solution. On the correct. business solution, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so what, tell us a little bit about the, the startup program. How was it when you set it up and how it evolved over time? So what is it today? Because it's still going. Yeah, so just to make it applicable as well to potentially to other you know, startups or smaller software companies. I mean, the goal was very simple. Right? How do we make sure, yes, we tell the story about what we do so that you know, there is like a, you know, a traditional uh, marketing outcome. You know, people know what we're doing and could buy the Salesforce software. That was obvious and that was you know, a given. You know, people would, would, would want to you know, understand what, what you sell and is it is any sort of discount or offer for startup. That's usually the norm now in today's, uh, today's world. But then the, 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 the other aspect was uh, promoting the developer platform. So uh, it was a big um, uh, focus on uh, uh, promoting the brand and explaining what we are doing through evangelism and all the things that you would imagine uh, you know, in developer meetups and things like this to tell the story. And so the good news, there was already an existing developer relations team. Mm-hmm. I was reporting to my, to my boss, to the, the, the VP of that team, so I could leverage that team. And, and you know, we built a, you know, an online platform that you can join and sign up for, all that kind of stuff, and started to uh, um, uh, optimize for a number of signups. You know? More than fifty thousand companies uh, despite back then, so we're trying to aim at the same volume. Was there is there a filter then on on uh, how you accept companies to be part of the yeah program? That's where I can go in the in the weeds, but I think it's a very good question. We decided intentionally not to have like some sort of high bar or high um, 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 mechanism, uh, complicated mechanism to check who were the startups and what kind of revenue, how old they are. Like I had in Microsoft, to be honest, just because it requires a lot of a uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, time and efforts and basically a dedicated team to enforce that. So we're more of an open program that had the ambition to build a community. And Salesforce is very good at this. If you look at right now, the whole concept of trailblazers and uh, you can invest like Dreamforce, they're very good at building communities. So that was the goal, really building a community. And that was the first part, back to your question. Uh, the first two years were really focused on this and then it was rolling and, you know, under the brand Salesforce for startups, very explicit. You know, you realize that Microsoft kind of copied the brain later with Microsoft for startup. <laughs> but um, no, it's an explicit name. Of course, it means what it means. Uh, and in the last two years, and uh, and um, I think we met at the time I was I was doing that. Um, uh, I ended up getting the um, the opportunity to launch a, a formal physical incubator in San Francisco. So that was a different playbook there. So that was a subset of the program, or 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 uh, something separate, somewhat. You know, uh, it's under the same brand, we're the same team, yeah. but I think I think it was a fairly different audience because, to be fair, it was mostly a way to help early stage companies get you know hands on support from a company like Salesforce in a physical space in yeah. San Francisco. So um, uh, similar brand, similar same team, uh, but the brand was a Salesforce incubator, and it was a tribute to an initiative that Salesforce had in two thousand and seven. So when Mark Benioff decided to actually um, uh, uh, launched the incubator. It was actually a relaunch. They had one back in 2007, which was kind of early back then. Uh, and so uh, it was based in San Mateo, not in the city, and designed in, in such a way where it didn't sustain. Let's put it this way. Uh, and so the idea is like, what can we do now? And and honestly, that was a kind of interesting challenge because there's a lot of corporate accelerators, incubators, and there's almost like a fatigue from founders. Like, what do I get out of it? So the challenge when I, I you know, I, I got this mission was to figure out how to bring value, you know, and how to have a value proposition for the startup that made sense. So we try to really focus on on access to customers, access to technical resources. Sounds straightforward. Uh, embrace the fact that you know it might not be the most sophisticated thing that you would do as a as a program owner, but the brand association, the legitimacy that a startup from Italy, from France, from the East Coast. Uh, or from Japan would get would be the fact that they would be selected to that program. So how to optimize for it and just embrace it, right? The brand association is very important. How to get uh, to cut the noise and be noticed 
by enterprise customers, for instance. So were the KPIs at that level different from the one that you set up, you know, the year prior or before that project? For example, I mean, is, is there any uh, sharing of uh, revenue sharing or any, you know, direct involvement with the business of the startups? Yeah, so of course, by design, where we were, you know, those programs, you, you can't manage, you know, more than, you know, 10 to 20 companies at the time. I think we had 12 companies in the first batch, maybe a little bit more in the second one. So volume wise, that was totally different world, right? Uh, uh, it was more about quality over quantity and recruitment at scale. Um, but uh, in terms of the metrics, uh, one of the way that uh, Salesforce works for on the developer platform, it's a revenue share indeed. So it was very easy to track, you know, how many of those companies would build an integration with Salesforce or a more ambitious app build on Salesforce platform and see what kind of revenue it could bring to the table. So it's it's part of the reason why I joined Salesforce. Again, I didn't go into detail, but yes, they have a developer platform. I didn't know about this. I was excited about the idea of promoting it, but also the way it was uh, the way it was monetized was not the typical uh, way. You know, the the, the Microsoft, the Amazon, the, the the Google of the world charge for cloud computing, which is you know how much storage you use and how much um, uh, compute you use. Very simple. It's kind of the electricity. You know, the more you consume, the more you pay. Salesforce is fairly uh, a bit different. It was basically a, a revenue share. So. You're building this app, we're going to take X percent of the revenue and you get the rest and the other way around, right? And so uh, this share alignment was something that really attracted me. So yes, there were some metrics that we couldn't really, really, you know, look closely at. So great. And now we're going to the current days uh, and yep. you, you use all this experience that you had uh, as a bridge between corporates and startups actually to do this as a, as a business at, at, at scale, right? As a yeah. service for a, a number of large corporates. So tell us a little bit more about the history of Silicon Foundry, how you end up there as uh, as a partner. Yeah. So I think, Marco, we share that a little bit, right? I think at some point in your career, you do all kinds of things just like you, your Google days, etc. And you're like, okay, what's, what's kind of a meaningful thing you can, you can help? And uh, and I know, I know uh, you have uh, certainly as well uh, expertise in this. We're trying to, you know, build a bridge between uh, between corporates and startups in, in a way, in a very unique way. I thought that's why I joined the company, uh, and mostly because you know, I, I well, first of all, there's kind of a, a fun anecdote. Like I, there's a company in New York that I like. It's technically an investment fund focused on enterprise software. The founder always said that innovation happened at the intersection of hoodies and suits. You know, so I don't want to limit that to the dress code, but that shows you that there is something in the middle that needs to be built, right? And that shows you as well there is antagonism. There is like, there is like two walls that not necessarily, I mean, dress the same. That's not a that the, who cares, but that don't necessarily understand each other. So, and I've been exposed to that throughout my career. So again, um, thank you for asking all those questions about the past. It was kind of a fun way to uh, uh, think about uh, what I did in the past. But I've been always meeting corporates uh, throughout the way. You know, at Microsoft, they would call me for an executive briefing and say, hey, why don't you meet this uh, large organization? You know, there's large Italian clients or this large, you know, um, uh, Japanese clients and, and tell how Microsoft does, you know, manage the ecosystem and create a developer ecosystem. And so I, I did that and I, I would have always a tendency to introduce startups that were built on Azure or built on Microsoft platform, you know, and then at, at Salesforce, same thing, right? And I, I realized over the years that those corporates were more and more sophisticated. They asked the right question and they understood that they needed to build as much as Microsoft or Salesforce does a, a developer ecosystem, and that's not their nature. And they need to engage with that, you know, ecosystem of innovation, as we call it. You know, that includes startups, yes, but also big emerging companies, the large tech players. And so, how do we optimize for it? And we remove like the cynicals on one side, the cynical on the other side, and we make it in such a way where it's, it can generate, you know, um, efficient outcomes. And that's kind of what Silicon, Silicon Foundry is about. So I joined. A year and a half ago, so in 2019, and um, and I, and, I, and that's really what we're doing. We're trying to identify some, you know, forward-thinking corporates who are pretty sophisticated. Usually, they do a lot of work with startups in their in their in their backyard. So it could be New York, it could be uh, Atlanta in the U.S., but it could be we have clients in Germany, in the U.K., in Japan, Korea, um, and um, and um, and they want to do business as well with you know the U.S., Silicon Valley, and you know we have a global footprint, so in some areas of the world. And we help them basically identify <laughs> the right companies that they should work with. Uh, and when I say that, I say that very loosely because the work with could be partner, as you know very well, this framework it could be partner, it could be invest, or it could be build with, right? It could be build a, a joint ventures or build technology together. So our job is to wake up in the morning and on their behalf, being outsiders, knowing what we know, being here in those conversations in Silicon Valley, knowing 
I'm in conversation with you, Marco, with you know all kinds of people, making sure we put them in front of those companies that we think they could do business with. Which is a little bit of a you know step forward because typically you, we've been doing you've been do, dealing with uh, tech companies where yeah. where technicalities and digitalization is embedded in the in the value core value, whereas most of the of the companies uh, and the large groups that you serve are non tech, non tech, right? so traditional. So maybe some examples. Some I don't know if you can mention some names of some of the companies or you know industry that you serve. No, absolutely. I mean, we usually, uh, all those clients are happy to also share some of those things that they're doing, right? Not being all, only focused on you know, the PR aspect of it, but I uh, love doing the, sharing those stories. And, and, and before I do so, just, just a quick you know, data point that I actually I read uh, you know, recently just to, <laughs> not only to make it an informal conversation, but IDC, the, the, the big uh, uh, analyst company, just said uh, recently that by 2023, so that means basically tomorrow, um, uh, 60% of the global 2000, so basically the largest companies in the world, we're talking more than half of them, will make, so it's always complicated, those stats, but will make, uh, uh, will, will build a um, developer ecosystem. So it's just not you and I having this conversation here in San Francisco, it's just happening. They have data to prove it, that they're building, they're intentional about building an ecosystem, but a developer ecosystem. So they'll need to use those tools, those programs, those <laughs> initiatives, that, 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 that expertise or, or that I just mentioned. When you say developer uh, ecosystem is really, you know, programmers, right? So we're talking people, about people, yeah. um, companies that are non-tech. Non-tech people, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, all the, the companies in the world will have to have developers to build upon their platform to, to create mm -hmm. things, right? And digital things, right? And, and so back to the stat, the stat says that uh, out of those companies, 50% of them will make 20 plus percent of their revenue coming from those digital streams. So uh, that means, yes, they need to do that, but the why? Because it has an impact on the bottom line. It's, it's, it means that, you know, I've, you know, we heard many times that software is eating the world. All companies become software companies. Even the, the, the traditional manufacturing companies become digital players. They, you know, the car manufacturers become assemblers of, you know, uh, mechanical parts as well as software. So it's just a reality when you're, when you're a car company and you assemble uh, uh, software, you need developers to build that software. So in that software developer could be Google, or it could be a smaller stage startups, you know, coming up in the south of San Francisco or in Milan somewhere, right? So I think I think that's some that's an understanding. I think all the boards, uh, you know, and have understood that, and so that's where I think we have some momentum trying to get them connected to, to 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 that. So back to your question about giving some examples. Yeah, we work with uh, we work with, for instance, you know, one of the most sophisticated clients is uh, BP Ventures, British Petroleum. So they are a very large investor and. Uh, and they've been doing that for a while. So as you can imagine, you know, uh, as a company that is um, focused on initially on oil and gas and producing, you know, gas and everything, they've been working uh, a lot with, you know, alternative energies and, and you know, solution and startup who can diminish the impact on the environment and CO2, that you would expect that from a player like them. But they're also working on the mobility space. Mm -hmm. uh, they're investing in other areas that are not that obvious on the, on the, on the, on the, on the first side, right? Uh, when you think of a company like them, like any other oil and gas companies in the world, they're also massive retailers with massive network of gas station. And they make probably more money sometimes selling, you know, things in the little convenience store next yeah. to the gas station. So in a world where you have an electric car and you're not gonna do your, you know, fill your tank in like in, in two or three minutes, how do, what kind of experience do you build around the gas station? So that's the type of topic that we try to you know, help them uh, understand, meet the right companies who can help them. And as a result, when, when, when we organize a meeting between a large client and a startup, it's we, we, we connect the corporates with the developer. At the end of the day, that's what we do. So we participate to the data points I was just mentioning. Playing devil's advocate there, but yeah. why do they need you to do this kind of job if they're their fund and their people dedicated to that? As a, as a, it's a good point. Uh, we handle that question all the time. So I have my answer. What I normally answer. I know, I know you do, and I, I know we agree on both, on many of those answers. But I think usually two two things are you know some of those organizations have the humility to understand that you know there's so much they can do uh, in terms of access to deal, etc. They they want to work with local players. And sometimes actually the problem they have is they have too much deal flow. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the capacity, the capability that we bring to the table is be able to filter out. Uh, and also by not having you know, the business card of our clients, sometimes we have the ability to be blunt, to ask the right question, to do some sort of fast due diligence right. checkpoints. Translation. Translation sometimes. And at the end of the day, you know, we're in the business of having, you know, optimizing for outcome, being very deal oriented and, and having people not waste their time. So 
That's one aspect for mostly the, the most um, advanced, uh, sophisticated organization. Usually they have a corporate VC, they have different programs. And then uh, another, another answer could be, uh, you know, you just humble to realize you're at the beginning of the journey, but the bar is high because, you know, a lot of corporates do that, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of capital is available, a lot of uh, initiatives are there. So, you know, how can you get some help just to do that properly, right? And I think, you know, staying super humbly, I mean, we, we try to build a bit re a good reputation with, with the ecosystem, with the startup, with the VCs, so that when they pick up the phone, when we call them, they know we represent a, a team at, at, at a large corporation that, you know, is here to do business. So you mentioned before the IDC data um, that tells the story of digital transformation at, 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 a, at the core, right? Correct. So the, the fact of a, becoming also a big opportunity for a, a significant revenue streams for companies that are non-tech. Yeah. We did a quick research not too long ago right. on the same, the same subset, the mm -hmm. number Fortune 2000 company that are present in the Silicon Valley, yeah. half of them or a little bit more than half have a corporate venture capital, yes. which is uh, which is definitely kind of different trends. And on that, I wanted to uh, ask you a few more questions. Second, second data point on that is that for the first time this year, the capital that is uh, um, being deployed in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. is uh, for the first time the majority is coming from outside of Silicon Valley. So where yeah. corporates and the rest of the world is involved. Through venture capital directly or indirectly. So how do you? What's your view today in the really in the implementation of corporate venture capital as one option to to develop in you know relationship with the world of innovation? So it's a very big topic, right? Yes. And I read your data. I think Japan was the number one yes, investor, right? right? By far. So, uh, with big players that we all know. But um, so obviously that's kind of core to what we're doing. A lot of our clients have a corporate venture arm um, and. Uh, I think, you know, it's funny because there's a lot of folks who are uh, kind of allergic to the notion of a corporate investing, which I think is, you can't generalize, it sounds like a silly statement if you don't look at the details. I think, I think corporates have a lot of assets to bring to the table. It's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people talk about smart money. I mean, how can you be smarter than bringing capital with access to customers and channels? So for me, I, I have a very simple religion, you know, it's like, if you can bring to the table some sort of unfair advantage, it could be data be access to customers, access to channel, something that's very unique, why would you say no? Just provide it, and Marco won't go into detail, but the terms are entrepreneur friendly. There's no like, you know, weird condition, but I think the bar is in, in such a, well, the, the, the expectation is in such a way that founders are smart and they know what to accept, when not to accept. So assuming all the contractual aspect is, 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 is clean, if I may say, um, I mean, there is there is actually a need for uh, you know founders to look at corporate VCs because they bring a lot to the table. And and to complement your data, I, I, I saw like uh, recently that half of the uh, uh, um, the venture capital uh, deployed in first quarter of 2019 was coming from corporates. Mm. So it's actually as much, if not I think a little bit even more than traditional institutional uh, venture investors. So I'm not saying it's better. I'm saying it could be, uh, um, uh, it, it is complementary. And I think, uh, uh, of course, if you're building, and I'm just going to use a counter example to that to be myself a devil advocate. If you're Airbnb and you're building as a renegade, a competitor to all the hotel chains like we've seen today, uh, you might not want to have an hotel brand. You know, might not want to have Hilton or Marriott on your cap table. So there are exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the guy who is only pro corporates. And yes, they're great. And all the corporate VCs out there, uh, are the right, you know, uh, you, need, you need as founders to take the money from them, but you need to be smart. If you do enterprise software, that might make sense to have Salesforce Ventures on your cap table because they can bring a lot to the table. I experienced that firsthand, right? So now you're talking about the, the points of view of an entrepreneur. So let's flip it. So you are, you know, you have a middle to large corporates coming from uh, Middle East of Europe that is not doing financial service, not an insurance. Yes. So it's kind of far from the world of a uh, of numbers and, and, and finance, uh, would you, and have, you know, an open, an open uh, um, range of options and, and right. budget coming from the CEO, which is, you know, fortunately now becoming more of a, you know, not an exception. I'm not saying it's the norm, but it's definitely you see the numbers are growing on the, you know, that uh, uh, evolution of, uh, of uh, priorities of um, um, having an open innovation strategy and budget. Yeah. Would you, um, consult them, would you suggest them to look at a corporate venture capital as an option? And if yes, how? Yeah, definitely not in all cases. I would argue general rule is like, 
walk, you know, crawl before you walk and run. Uh, so I think we've seen the number of corporate VCs pop up. I think it's in the, in the in a, in, a, in a few hundreds in the last couple of years, so it's really massive. Uh, you just don't want to do that the wrong way, and you need to hire the right team. So actually, that's part of what we do: is advising on what to do and the governance. We wouldn't set it up. We don't manage the capital. We don't, you know, we don't do the execution of it. But I think setting up, setting it up, is definitely something. Or sorry, advising on how to set it up is something that we're doing. So the answer is yes. But I think the first conversation is to take a step back is what's your goal? What do you want to accomplish? Does that make sense to make minority investment in companies if it's your first move? Probably not. In my opinion, the venture arm, the, the capital, it's just, you know, it's an instrument. It's skin in the game. It's an instrument to do what I should generally call, you know, business development or, you know, corp dev or strategic business development, maybe. So we usually try again, unless they have one already, to have this conversation and say maybe the first move would be actually more to uh, invest in existing funds. And I think it's a, it's a common thought around, amongst a lot of uh, people in the industry that you, you might want to invest in a fund to get all the benefits of having access to a deal flow, mm -hmm. um, to having access to you know, companies that could be great. You get to know, you know the investors and you don't, you don't you know, decide to be an investor overnight. You just rely on a professional who do so. And, and there's a lot of funds that become very, very targeted. You have a lot of funds doing like commerce or property tech, you know, um, constructions and, and things like this where it's very specific. So as a corporate for us, it's one of the things we've been doing for some of our clients is identify, hey, you're a fashion and beauty company, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you can imagine the brands I'm thinking of. Uh, what are the, the small funds? You know, it could be very early stage to be in the trenches, to be in the action, meet founders, something that the corporates not, tend not to have the strengths to do and get the deal flow from them, learn all, have basically all the benefits without necessarily operating the, the investment arm. And then as they grow and learn about it, then of course they can, they can put a fund together and, and be co-investors and be in the ecosystem. So I think, I guess my long answer to your question is like, you know, you need to think about it uh, and, uh, and uh, there's multiple options. Though when you're doing this uh, filtering, clearly the vast majority of then the concentration of capital and, and potential VCs will be here, right? So it yes. becomes a, a door to Silicon Valley to be, to become a player in Silicon Valley, which is probably one of the value proposition of, a, of of what we do, what you do. Absolutely, and again, I think both you know Mind the Bridge, uh, Silicon Foundry, we we are we deeply embedded here. I mean, our team is uh, uh, at this point, you know. Uh, uh, fully here in San Francisco. Of course, we're thinking about the future uh, uh, and, and probably will go in other places. But yes, there is there is a density of capital here. There's a density of not only capital, but ecosystem, right? I mean, there's a lot of founders when I was at Microsoft who came to me, I was reporting to the product organization. And after two minutes, they're like, Ludo, can you connect us with your the venture teams? And I'm like, you, you probably, have, you know, yes, I can. And probably, probably it makes sense, but there's a lot you can learn. You know, you can get from an organization like Salesforce, but it could be Google, it could be Facebook, it could be any of this big ecosystem that has more value uh, from a trip in Silicon Valley than just raising another million dollars. That technically, back to your, your comments, you can raise in Chicago, in New York, in Milan, in Paris, like venture capital is everywhere. We say that, you know, uh, um, uh, now there is a democratization, there is like crowdfunding and Angelist and all those initiatives. Yes, you come to Silicon Valley at some point to raise capital in, some, in your growth, especially in some, in some areas of businesses or type of startups. But you can, you can, you can uh, get your company started without, without that. To finish, um, you know, like, like all, all men, all people in a, in a bar thinking about it, what, what <laughs> can... In the uh, picture. In the picture. Drinking in a bar. Drinking in a bar. Well, actually, two. First, we do one in preparation of that. What do you think is, uh, in your view, this world of uh, of uh, corporate innovation would turn into in the next five to ten years? A macro level. I mean, uh, one of the things that we see more and more significantly is most of the large uh, management consulting companies are moving there because growth uh, and management for growth is management for innovation strategy, and yet, so uh, cool. as as a result, it's. There's a lot of uh, movement happening there. What, what else uh, can you see from your standpoint? So a few things come to mind. So the, the most spontaneous thing, I think is going to become more and more mainstream. So, you know, I think uh, 
the innovation and you know i don't know if uh, you know it's like chief digital officer to what extent you're gonna have still that title right. uh, become digital you know you don't have a chief internet officer in a yeah. company you don't have a chief you know cloud officer those mm -hmm. things you take them for granted so maybe innovation uh digital those things will be embedded uh, i believe in the chief another ceo uh, the chief ecosystem officer i mean that justify a little bit what i've been talking about i haven't seen that pop up so if you see one it's already taken as a as a i know the ceo don't want that digital, to happen yeah, it's yeah. going to be confusing CEO two ceos too, you right? know salesforce has also a chief equality officer huh? and it was actually a statement to say we have two ceos but anyway so i think i think ecosystem um uh, is something that's going to grow the rest will be more mainstream and and so you're still going to need to, you know, help those companies do it. And there's still going to be a lot of activities, but it's going to be probably more mainstream, so to say, and startup will learn how to do that. And hopefully, and that's my wish, it's going to be more efficient on both sides to work with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I would say is uh, we've seen uh, we've seen a rise of uh, a model that's pretty interesting to me called the startup studios, the bench studios. Yes. It's this idea of co-creating. So is, is, is this working? Because I've never seen a scale, right? So uh, it's certainly just a few here and there, but uh, it's been on and off for quite some time. Maybe the topic of another uh, fire yeah, because we'll it's, to, I don't have a short answer for that. I think I think my short answer is we it's early to tell, but those companies have ambition, and as you know, you, you can't judge a success after a couple of years. We know there's a lot of a, you know, accelerators focused organization who move to that startup studio. So it's maybe the new. I, I don't want to say the new, uh, the new, the new thing uh, um, a la mode, <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think I think that's a cool model because you basically try to get the best of both worlds, you know. And and some people are very cynical and say it cannot work because of the incentives and founders will be founders; they have to be separate. But I think in many cases, it's back to when you have an unfair advantage, when you have an asset coming from the corporates and the entrepreneurial spirits and new students, fresh blood, people who wants to build fast, etc. You put that together. It's not easy, but if you manage to find a model, I think something amazing can come out of it. So back to your question, in corporate innovation, I'm bullish about that model. And I, I really cross my finger that it works out and it becomes mainstream. And maybe another another answer to your question would be around uh, sustainability. I mean, it's a topic we talk about uh, a lot. But when I look at, you know, I uh, was just having a conversation with that actually this morning. But a lot of our members, a lot of our clients across industries of geographies, have this imperative of becoming more sustainable. And it's probably the, the most, uh, the single common denominator across our different member base, mm -hmm. from financial institution to um, uh, to um, uh, manufacturing companies. That, that understand it from, I mean, from an oil and gas, clearly, you know. That's my point. But you know, you're talking but financial banks. banks. Uh, we work with airlines. They need to also focus on their footprint and sustainability. <laughs> and also, again, sustainability, not to save the planet only, you know. In Italy and France, we love, we like that, you know, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, this it's week a, is particular, yeah. this week in particularly, I mean, let's not go into the geopolitics aspect of it, but, but uh, it's also because it impacts the bottom line. If, you know, we, uh, if, you know, uh, one of the large airlines, you know, managed to diminish rent to a new advanced material, the, you know, the, uh, the, the way they make the shell of a seat in a plane, they're going to save money on, uh, and of course have an impact on the environment. So it's, it's a multidimensional conversation, but I think more and more it translates into as well the investment thesis of our clients when they invest in companies, whether it's minority investment or they do acquisition, M&A, uh, I think sustainability is growing. So I'm expecting that to be part of the investment thesis as a, as I would argue a requirement, right? And it's nothing political or we want to save the world. Or, you know, it, it's literally a necessity that impacts the bottom line. That's a great other point, uh, how to measure that. But that's uh, that's food for, for another chat. Yeah. Last one, of old man at the, at the bar drinking tea. This time it's tea, okay. Mm -hmm. What is Ludo's uh, today, um, you know, if 20 years ago, meaning that if you were to define and, and, and just graduated from university, define yes. your future career with what you know today, what would you do? Or what would you... Uh, you know, suggest people that have a similar ambition. If I had done something different, basically, right? But um, with, with what you do, what you know today, with the yeah. world of today. Uh, I think I'm just gonna go back to this idea of uh, um, the startup studio, not to be too tactical about the the program itself, but I think trying to find a way where you can uh, uh, build a company, be an entrepreneur. You know, it's a it's, it's, it's not something that, you know, when I graduated was like that common, like, like now they didn't have all the support, uh, infrastructure organization, like mind the bridge, all the, the press and everything around it. So still have that passion and that, that, that willingness to change the world, you know, with a bit of naive attitude sometimes, but I think I had that. 
but maybe matching that with uh, something that you know limits the risk, which is this association with the corporates. Mm -hmm. And honestly, no regret because back then uh, it didn't happen. The corporates have no appetite whatsoever to do that. So I know a lot of people could be still cynical and might listen to our conversation and say, "Oh, this guy is pro corporates." It's not exactly how it works. Yes, there's you need to be nuanced. You know, there's a lot of things that don't work and the wrong people in the jobs and things like this. But when you look at today's world, like the fact that there is this appetite for both parties to work together, I think if I was graduating right now, I would try to be in at that intersection, you know, have the my hoodie and my suit and you know and work a, a rock around it. I think I think that's that that that's what I would be. Great. That's well, what I'd do. That's gonna be our next twenty years then. Yeah. Excellent <laughs> indeed. Absolutely. All thank right. you, Marco. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you.